Hello and welcome to the Essex Boys Murder Case Part 46. Before watching this video, I recommend watching Part 4 almost on YouTube first, as these videos are all about the key individuals and the murder victims movements on the day of the 6th of December 1995. A quick mention to the Facebook page called The Real Essex Boys Murder Club. If you're interested, please feel free to join. I see some great people on there with a lot of knowledge on this subject. So, this is the third instalment of the Hitman videos to see if Mick Jack and Darren Nichols paid a contract killer uh, to take out the Essex boys. Uh, in part one, I discussed if Mick Steele and the others had a meeting at the Notorious Bowes crime family um, from North East London at their gym and put them in contact there with the contract killer they knew would be perfect for the job in taking out the Essex boys. Now from there, Mick Steele and the others told the hitman their plan to lure Tucker, Tate and Rolfe down a quiet farm track in the Rettendon area where he would be lying in wait and begin the executions. Um, in part two, I discussed an Alan Grayson's statement and what he said he saw as he drove past the farm track two days before the murders. In this video, I'm going to go through another witness statement and what he and his partner saw on the night of the murders. Uh, before I do start with jo Joseph Kolinsky's statement, I just want to pick up on Darren Nichols' statement uh, from what he said after he received uh, the call from Jack um, to come and pick them up. Uh, so Darren gets the call and he sets off about a quarter of a mile up to the entrance of the track which is just here where the cursor is. Uh, the time was about 7.05pm. Now Darren Nichols states that Jack came up the track first alone and got into the back of the Passat. Now Nichols asked uh, where Mick was to which Jack replied he won't be long, he's looking for something. Now was Mick paying the hitman his final instalment now the executions have been carried out? Now Jack can't comment on any of this um, because he says he wasn't there that night and Darren Nichols is lying. I mean Darren Nichols can say what he wants here. Um, I mean let's not forget it's it's his second statement we are going on here and the police have most definitely helped him as they know um, the times of the mobile phone phones that were um, used in this area at the time uh, so they could have worked together um, to fit anything they wanted in this part now Mick can't say anything either because he says he wasn't there that night so why was Mick Steele late walking back up the track. I mean, according to Darren Nichols, Mick did eventually get into the Passat and he said he was picking some gun parts up. I mean, is it possible Darren Nichols made this part up? Did Mick Steele pay the hitman? I mean, Darren Nichols, he doesn't know the name of the contract killer and neither do the other two. Um, I mean, he's not going to use his real name when doing these type of jobs. Um, so it would have been pointless for Darren Nichols to mention any of this in his statements. I mean, he wouldn't want the notorious Bowers after him uh, as well. Um, so he won't want to mention any of this in his statements. I mean, he, after all, he just wants Mick Steele and especially Jack off his back for good. I mean, Darren Nichols definitely doesn't want to get involved um, with the uh, the Boers. Um, but yeah, I mean, you may be thinking it was dark down the track. How can Mick give the hitman the money and, and, and give it a quick, quick check to make sure it was all there? Uh, well, the back passenger door was open um, for the hitman to begin the executions. So the interior, interior light... Um, is on after the murders. 
Uh, the Range Rover was still running and the headlamps would still be on. Uh, we know the Range Rover was stationary due to Craig Rolfe waiting for the gate to be opened and the forensics report states carbon deposits were found under the uh, Range Rover which suggests the engine was still running in a stationary position uh, so there is sufficient time for Mick to pay the hitman his final instalment in a lit part of the murder scene after telling Jack um, to, um, to go make sure Darren was at the entrance with the car running um, after this the Range Rover engine is turned off as not to attract any attention from poachers or game shooters in the nearby area um, after Mick pays the contract killer his final instalment um, he heads back up the track uh, to the others and the hitman makes his getaway over the Retterdon Hall gate uh, which is in a close proximity uh, to the to the murder scene which I showed you in um, part two of these hitman videos um, so the five bar gate would have been about there where the cursor is and I think it's just about just here is the, the Retterdon Hall gate it's just about there where I am now so they are in very close to each other um, so he sets off after climbing over the gate and he crosses into it crosses over and climbs into this field here runs along this part of the stretch of the field here um, he then crosses into another field and I think there's one more um, and then he decides to walk round the back of the housing estate so he's not noticed by any walkers by or witnesses in cars driving past him um, I mean he doesn't want to see anywhere near that farm track um, he eventually comes out of a field and takes a short walk onto the main road um, where it would be just a short distance um, to where he's parked his vehicle uh, what I will do for you is a Google Earth view of the Hitman's escape route after I've gone through Joseph Kowalinski's statement, uh, which I will do now. So, what I will, da will do now for the purposes of this video is reenact what Joseph Kowalinski and his partner were doing and what they saw on the A130 on the evening of the murders. Um, if I do it this way, you'll be able to visualise what happened that night. Uh, it's just better than me just reading out his statement of, of what he and his partner saw on the, uh, the night of the murders. So, according to Joseph Kolinsky's statement, he says that on the 6th of December 1995, he was working in the Essex area. Um, he is a dental practitioner and works in different parts of Essex. Now his intention was to drive him and his partner back home to Sudbury in London but because he had a, a work session at Basildon Great O Clinic the next day they decided that they would uh, look for overnight accommodation. Now at about 6 to 6.15pm 6 they were in the Brentwood area and the weather was worsening. Now they tried to obtain overnight accommodation at the travel lodge on the A127 at um, East Horden. Now just here is the travel lodge along the A127 next to the uh, little chef that I'll speak about in a moment but just coincidentally this A127 we just go next door to the little chef some people who's been following the uh, day of the murder videos uh, will definitely recognize this place this is the halfway house pub uh, where the Essex boys pull up in the car park just to the right here and speak to Mick Steele on the evening of the murders and I mean how spooky is this Joseph Kowalinski and his partner 
at the same time are at the travel lodge just two buildings away trying to get uh, overnight accommodation around about the same time so yeah I mean that's a bit it's a bit spooky is that So, Joseph Kolinsky said uh, there was no vacancies, so they decided to go next door, which is here, uh, the little chef, to have a meal. And they left at 7.30pm, and then they drove on to the Watermill Travel Lodge in Basildon, and en route they saw another place called the Campoline Hotel. Uh, they decided to try for vacancies, um, but theirs were full up. Uh, they travelled to the Watermill Lodge, the Travel Lodge, but, but they were also full up. Uh, they then made the decision to go back to um, Sudbury. Now, on their way back, travelling to Wickford along the A132, and they decided uh, to try one more place, which was the, um, the Toby Inn. Uh, so Joseph Kowalinski and his partner drove in here and this was literally their last chance. Uh, yeah, they would have parked up somewhere, gone in here. Tried to get overnight accommodation. And unfortunately it was full up. Um, so they had no choice but to head towards the um, Rettenden Turnpike. And head towards Chelmsford. And then eventually they could make their way home um, to Sudbury um, in London. They would have come out here and would have turned left and headed, headed towards the um, Rettenden Turnpike, uh, which is just up here. Yeah, so Joseph and his partner, um, has just I've just left the A132. Headed towards the Retterden Turnpike, and they've come up along this road here, which is Main Road, the A130, and they're going to be heading towards Chelmsford and then Sudbury in London. Um, before we start off on this journey along Main Road on the A130, please bear in mind back then in 1995, this road was a country road. Um, there would not have been much street lighting um, along this country road back then. Uh, well, not until there is a, a small built up area, which is a bit further on. Um, that we may get to on this video. I might go up there uh, to the built up area I haven't decided yet. Uh, it just depends if I've got enough time making this video. Um, if I do, um, we can get up to the built up area. I can show you where Dan and Nichols parts parked up that evening and waited for the, the phone call off Jack. Um, but back to this country road and in in, uh, in 95, just remember it was snowing and it was settling on the ground. Uh, there were also grass verges um, to park up on the left side of the road. Uh, and also it also would have been dark at this time of the night and visibility would have been minimal. Uh, so let's visualise Joseph Kolinsky's journey that night and go through um, his statement. So there's him and his partner are heading up in this direction. And the time is approximately, I'd say what, 8 to 10 past 8 p.m. Now he's driving at a speed of 15 to 20 miles per hour um, due to the um, bad weather. Uh, he said his headlamps were on 
and the windscreen wipers were on. Uh, he said the snow was falling and settling and he had to take care uh, whilst driving. Um, at the same time, he was wearing glasses, which he always did when driving. He's mildly short-sighted. Um, and Norma, his partner, was sat in the uh, front passenger seat. Now, as they drove along the A130, um, he is not sure at the time of making this statement exactly what point along the road, but he saw a man... Um, who he will describe further on. Now he said he had been driving uh, around 10 or 15 minutes from the last stop being the Toby Inn. Uh, the first he saw of the man was some movement from the right hand side. He had been looking ahead and remembers seeing the man to his front and over his right side. Uh, looking back, he thinks he was travelling on a, a left bend, but cannot be certain. He knows he saw the man very briefly, about a, a second or two. Now he was certain he had come off a field close to the road. He saw him at a point where he had stopped running and just started walking uh, he was now walking at right angles and he doesn't know where he went uh, he said there were other cars in the area but traffic was fairly light um, his initial reaction having seen the man um, was that he thought it was strange um, he wondered why he had um, uh, f from that direction of the field he then noticed the man was wearing wearing a balaclava uh, he describes the man as being not not notably large or small he said they were five foot eight to six foot tall um, he wore a balaclava but thinks he was white as they were a Definite contrast of colour between the balaclava and his face. Uh, the balaclava could have been dark in colour. Um, it covered all of his head apart from his eyes, nose and mouth. Now he can only say that this, um, that his, his clothing, he, may have, he could only re re recognise a, a short jack jacket. And he got the impression it may have been padded. Now he thinks he was of medium build. And he could not see if he was carrying anything. He did not notice his footwear. He was seen to recall him seeing him swinging his arm alongside of him. In a position where his body and posture was indicative of him just having stopped running and slowing down to walk. Um, he cannot describe the colour of his clothes. He would estimate he was in his view for a second or two at a distance of around 20 feet. His view was restrict restricted, obviously, due to the snow. As far as he recalls, there was no street lighting on the stretch of road. Now where he saw me, he also remembered the road was bendy. Now to the relation of the man, his impression was certainly uh, not that of a child or elderly person. Since that night, he had heard about the murders in Rettendon. He and his partner discussed over the next few days as to whether they should contact the police or not. He was not certain as to how much use it would be because he didn't see much detail. Um, but eventually he decided to report the matter. Uh, so the reason we've stopped at this part of Main Road on the A130 is because I think this is the, um, the bend Joseph 
Kowalinski is talking about in his statement. Now, from leaving the Toby Inn back in Wickford at around 8pm-ish and the the time him and his partner left there and drove along the A130 and, and spotting him on, on a bend on this road, time-wise, it most probably is the bend he is talking about. Uh, remember, it was snowing that night and there wouldn't have been any leaves on the trees due to the wintry weather. Um, there wouldn't have been any street lighting uh, and he was driving with his headlamps on along with his windscreen wipers. He's going round what he explains as a, b a bend on the country road and sees a man coming off a field close to the road. Now he saw him to the point where he had seen him stop running and now walking. And he also noticed he was wearing a balaclava. So, what was this suspicious man doing running along a field then joining the pathway on Main Road? I mean, it's about, say, 8.25 to 8.30pm. Uh, it's dark. Uh, the snow is beginning to settle, so it would have been cold that night. I mean, why is he hiding his face with a balaclava? I mean, they're not exactly fashion accessories. But they are perfect if you don't want to be identified. I mean, where did he be? What was he running from? And there's apparently just been a triple murder up the road, uh, down a deserted farm track, not so long ago. And this man is running from the area, using the fields for cover, so not to be seen. He comes out, on, out on, onto the pathway here, um, and he's got a balaclava on, so he can't be identified. And, and then he disappears out of sight, um, heading towards the Rettenden roundabout, about a quarter of a mile away. Could this be the hitman Mick Steele and the others had hired to take out the Essex boys? I mean, after the executions, he has fled the murder scene, climbing over the Rettenden Hall gate, walking over a few fields and going round the back of the housing estate, using the back fields there, and come out just here and walks down towards the Rettenden roundabout. Um, where he's, he's, he may have a vehicle parked up outside uh, a local garage, uh, which, which is just left of the uh, Retterton roundabout. I mean, he could have driven his vehicle up here earlier before anyone else set off. And then, then he's just waited at the end of the roundabout um, for Darren Nichols and Jack to turn up in the Passat. And they've given him a lift up this road here and to the um, the farm track where it where he needs to be um, if i remember rightly when forensics eventually got hold of the passat they were prints and dna they could not account whose they were um, i know a few people came forward after being interviewed and admitted they had been in the car at some point prior to the murders um, so back to this suspicious male, um, he's not um, going to want his vehicle parked up anywhere near the farm track. Um, he's not going to take uh, a chance parking on the grass verges heading up, on, up the A130 towards the track. He wants it far away and parked somewhere where it doesn't look suspicious. Um, outside a garage which is also close to the... Um, Retton Turnpike um, for a quick getaway. It's perfect. Um, if you haven't seen part two of these Hitman videos, um, I should say, if, if you've seen part two of these Hitman videos, you will know I covered a statement by an Alan Grayston. Now he said he saw a man in the field belonging to Retton Hall, which is right uh, next to the entrance to the track 
two days uh, before the uh, murders. Now he noticed um, a man there and he had a pair of binoculars on him. Now the description he gave of the suspicious male was white skinned, European, early to mid thirties, five foot ten to six foot tall, well built and fit looking. The description Joseph Kowalensky gave of his suspicious male is five foot eight to six foot tall. Even though he had a balaclava on, he said his skin was white and he it was not a child or elderly person, more of a adult. Could these two people be the same person? The descriptions of the two witnesses are somewhat familiar. Was the hitman checking his escape route using his binoculars on the 4th, two days before the executions? Then, on the night of the murders, he does just that and makes his escape over the fields, uh, where he spots a gap of trees and a gate next to them, uh, just here, and decides um, he's far enough away from the murder scene now. And from here, he just needs to get onto the pathway and make his way down to the roundabout, um, down the road, and get into his vehicle, uh, which is parked up out of the way close by. Uh, let's not forget, Alan Greyston stated that the suspicious male he saw, he described him as fit looking. Um, well, he's got to be quite fit if he's going to, to get away from the murder scene using field after field after field. Uh, then used other fields to walk all the way around the estate um, and then come out at this point here. He may have even got in his vehicle and, and driven back up this country road heading towards Chelmsford, uh, then on to London. I mean, he would have passed uh, the murder scene, uh, then drove on past White House Farm. I mean, it is known that murders like to go back to the scene of the crime. Uh, Joseph Kowalinski made his statement on the 15th of December, uh, 1995, uh, and then the police drove him along the A130 to find out just exactly where he said he saw the suspicious male that night. And then on the 18th of December, 1995, at about... Uh, 5.15 p.m. he was with Sergeant Sanford and Constable Chapel of the Essex Police when they drove along the route he had taken on the 6th of December. Now at the time of viewing the area he pointed out the rough place where he had seen the person although the weather conditions were different to what they had been on the 6th. Now the area he pointed to was an estimation of about a quarter of a mile from Rettenden Roundabout and it was before the built up area. Uh, so, having done the research for this video, um, this place we are at now is about a quarter of a mile from the roundabout he's talking about. Now, there is a slight bend in this part of the country road here, where Joseph Kowalinski noticed the suspicious male. I want to do the um, Google Earth view later on. If I remember, um, I'll try and show an image of this bend in the road from the Google Earth view uh, to show you as well. And if we turn back round. Now, all the rest of the road up here is straight before you get to the um, built up area. So, this is the place where Joseph Kowalensky saw the man in the balaclava the night of the murders running out of the fields just here. And he begins to walk along the, um, the pathway here. Tell you what I'll do is just carry on up a bit along the A130 and I will show you that um, 
built up area. But yeah, from the research I've done, this is where I think Joseph Kolinsky is on about, where the balaclava man comes out of this field here and joins his pathway here and makes his way down towards the Rettenden roundabout. So right, yeah, we'll carry on um, along the uh, main road. So after I've um, shown you the uh, built up area, which is just up here, I'll move on and show you the, uh, the Google Earth image of the possible escape route the hitman um, may have taken uh, that night after the uh, executions and I'll see if I can remember to look for that bend in the road as well we're almost here now yeah this is the built up area now as we are, we are approaching and just here on the right is the um, is the estate now this road here meadow road and uh, this is where Darren Nichols said he parked uh, the Passat up that night and waited for the uh, call for Jack to come and pick them up um, he parked the car on the uh, the last house on on the left hand side he said Tell you what, we'll just go down here. So this is this is where he said it. He parked up just here on the left hand side, waiting for the call that evening. And then when he eventually said he got the call, he set off. And he said he turned right and headed about a quarter of a mile up towards the. Uh, the entrance to the track and um, eventually we will leave the murder scene with Mick Still and the others because at the moment we are up to 7.05 p.m. Um, we will set off and I will be coming down this road and heading towards the um, Rettenden roundabout um, eventually there's just so much to cram in at this um, 7.05 p.m. Uh, right, so we'll do, we'll move on to the um, Google Earth view now. Okay, so this is the uh, Google Earth view, and this is White House Farm. And um, just down here is the entrance to the track. And it's just here that I'm circling now. And the Essex boys would have gone along down this track here and eventually ended up down here. Just about here that I'm using the cursor now. The five bar gate would have been there. Um, and I know someone might mention in comments that there were some footprints um, seen the following day. Now then footprints would have led along this field here I think they went up here eventually um, okay right so uh, Rettenden Hall is up here there you go that's Rettenden Hall And I'm going to try and pinpoint the, the gate that they owned that I showed earlier in this video. It's, I think it's it, it's in this field here. So it's there. Let's try and get... So the gate owned by Rettenden Hall is here, where the cursor is now. And the five bar gate, what brought the Range Rover to a hall, is it would have been about here. So they are quite close and I'm 
this is the field here that Alan Grayson saw the the man with the binoculars um, two days um, before the uh, murders heading down in this direction so after the hitman got paid um, did he climb over this gate here and head over the fields belonging to Retton Hall over here I mean if it was the hitman on the 4th looking down at the Retton Hall gate and the, I mean he could have decided this was the escape route I mean if the binocular man and the balaclava man are the same person and he was the hitman that night I mean did he climb over that gate and run along this field here um, and he's got to this part here which is owned by um, Rettenden Hall and, and he climbs over over this part here I mean I know you can't see it from this view um, but there is some fencing down here that he could have climbed over and then another set of fencing this side and he could have climbed into this this field here and, and made his escape along this road I mean I mean if he came out there it is too close to the farm track um, that's no good for him he wants to be seen far away from from he wants to keep as far away as possible from the the murder scene as he can um, so he's making his way around the fields here of the built up area along here I mean it would have taken some time to go around these fields especially with it's snowing and it's starting to settle But eventually he makes it across into the next field here, working his round way around the, the built up area. Gets through this part here and heads down here. To this part here that I'm circling now this is where the gate was earlier this is where Joseph Kowalenski saw the suspicious male wearing a balaclava coming out of this field stop, stopped running and began walking and then in right angles walking along the, the road here until he could see him no longer let's see if I can find that left but yeah it is look a left bend if you can see it here see if I can here it just slightly bends here to the to the left all this here so th this is the left bend Joseph Kolinsky is talking about here And, and and now he's on the pathway. Um, he's working. His, he's making his way down um, to the roundabout, which is just down here. Here we are. I mean, he he could have parked his his vehicle at this car garage sales place here. I mean, it's a nice easy getaway. I think. Oh, what's it called? Um, Crouch Vale Car Sales uh, on Woodham Road. I mean, he could have come up here first, while the others are still at the halfway house um, pub car park, parked his vehicle here, so it's not looking suspicious. I mean, he, he could have 
then walked over here somewhere where the bus stop is here waited for Jack and Darren um, to drive up here to the turnpike and got a lift off off them uh, and then took him up to the uh, the entrance of the farm track and then Darren goes and, and waits somewhere close by and waits for the phone call after the murders have been committed and then uh, he makes his escape route over the uh, the fields so he can't be spotted nowhere near the scene and comes out further down the road of the A130 and he walks down here and he gets into his vehicle here maybe and gets makes his getaway so yeah I mean if the binocular man and the balaclava man are the same person um, then to me I mean he's, he's done his own recce of the area and knows his best uh, rule away from the murder scene um, which will be on foot uh, and he's used uh, the fields to, to his advantage um, I tell you what I'll do for the last part of this video um, I'll take you to the Retterton roundabout where the balaclava man um, has probably walked, walked to and um, take a close look at that um, car sales place Um, so yeah, I mean, the hitman, um, he could have driven ahead um, at the um, halfway house pub where the others were. Uh, and he could have driven ahead, he could have parked his vehicle um, somewhere here. Well, it's not going to look suspicious just parking it here. Um, and he could have got out of his vehicle and he, he could have... Just walked a short distance over there. Um, just over here. This is the turning for the A130. I mean, he could have just waited up there for uh, Jack and Darren uh, to turn up in the Passat and got a lift up to the track. And then um, after the executions, he's made his way down the fields until he's far enough away from the murder scene. He's got his balaclava on. He makes the, the, the short walk down to this roundabout uh, heads in this direction um, to get in his vehicle and then make his escape so um, just before I finish with this video I just want to mention um, this road here uh, which is Woodham Road now this is the road that Billy Jasper says he drove Mr D that night about 11.30 p.m. Um, I will be covering Billy Jasper's journey when I've finished with Mick Steele and the others um, but yeah this is the road he said uh, Mr D told him to drive up um, that night um, so that's it for part three of the hitman videos i hope you've enjoyed it and don't forget my youtube subscribers get to watch my videos first as i don't load them onto the facebook group for at least a week later uh, if you do want to join the facebook group it's called the real essex boys murder club uh, we have new posts being put up on, on a daily basis i know some people join because they they've seen the films and when they see posts and comments from other members they say oh i didn't know this happened or i didn't know that happened i've just seen the films and um, trust me there's a lot to this case that's not in the movies or, or, or the books and you can find out this by joining the uh, biggest and best essex boys group out there um, all we ask is respect other people's opinions on there as we all have our own theories on what we think happened uh, that night um, and last of all, um, I'd just like to thank the admins who do a great job of keeping the group um, ticking over. So until next time, take care.